My name is John Frederick Lemire, Chief Warrant Officer, United States Coast Guard, retired, also known as Jack. Also, Hamba Maninga, Ingaidi, and Much Kiki Cottage. I was born on the res here in 35, and 37, my mother and I left and went to California. Can you tell me who your mother and your father My are? mother's name was Veronica Hansen. She was, uh, well, graduated from school, raised in, in school in Lamar's. But she met my dad, Max, uh, well as Frederick Maxwell Lemire in uh, Pipestone. She was a cook and he was a bus driver. And uh, along came Jack. I was born over here in 35. Maybe stories of the tribe. You know, my name is James Snow, uh, lifelong resident of Winnebago, uh, born in 1947. My parents were Chris Snow Sr. and Elizabeth Little Beaver Snow. <clears throat> my dad was a, a Buffalo clan. Uh, his Indian name was Wachojuga, which kind of means leader. And my mom was a member of the Water Spirit Clan. And uh, together they had uh, six children. Uh, my oldest brother was born in, uh, uh, born during childbirth. His name was Kenneth. My older brother, Joseph Haina, he was born in 1944, and I was born in uh, 1947. Went to school at uh, St. Augustine's Indian Mission and then from there I went to uh, uh, Catholic boarding school in uh, St. Paul's Indian Mission in Marty, South Dakota. And from there I graduated and, and uh, went to uh, uh, Greer Technical Institute in Chicago, Illinois, uh, which was uh, for, uh, got a certificate in welding. Returned home to Winnebago in 1966 and then uh, because of the time at the, because it was time during the Vietnam War and the, the, the draft, uh, since I didn't, I, I'd finished uh, my schooling and so then I was reclassified back to 1A. Uh, if you were in school, you would get an academic deferment, but uh, so then uh, got a letter from the, the draft board telling me to report to duty in October of 1966, so I drafted into the Army and um, went down to Omaha, got sworn in, took a long train ride to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, and uh, went, uh, went through the uh, process uh, down there. And then from there, I was sent to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas to complete my basic training which I thought was a good thing for me because uh, I was closer to home. Only about four, four hours, four and a half hours away, so it's worked out pretty good. And I stayed there until we went to, uh, uh, my uh, MOS was a tank driver and a tank gunner, so I went to um, school in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky to, on tanks and stuff. And then returned to um, Fort Riley, Kansas, we were, uh, being trained on a, a, a tank that was being uh, get uh, being ready to shipped over to Vietnam, and he was trying to work the bugs out. Uh, it was called a Sheridan tank. It was a lightweight tank, but it had a big cannon on it—a 155 millimeter laser guided cannon. And um, but in November of that year, I, I got orders again, saying I would be shipped to uh, the Republic of Vietnam. So I arrived in Vietnam in January of 1968, and that was right around the Tet Offensive. My name is Valma Alanese, and my maiden name was Thomas, from the Thomas family. I'm Wolf Clan, Shunkshunk I was born in 1934 here in Winnebago at the old hospital, and um, my Indian name is Hadaja Hanaji, which means standing on the light. And it was given to me by John Rave uh, in a peyote ceremony. 
Um, I went to school in Winnebago all through from first grade through 12th grade and graduated in 1951. Then I went to Haskell in Lawrence, Kansas and took commercial business there for two years. Then I came back to Winnebago and got a job at the hospital. And then from there I went into the Army. After three years working, then I went into the Army. And I was stationed in Fort Myer, Virginia for two years. And I worked at the Pentagon. And I worked, I was a secretary for two generals and a major. About eight years old when that uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, I remember it very vividly on the radio. Uh, we never had a radio ourselves, but I heard it on the radio of our next door neighbor, that Franklin Roosevelt proclaiming uh, the uh, state of war exists with uh, Japan and that attack on Pearl Harbor. So, uh, in my, my neighborhood, there was a, uh, a Naval Reserve outfit. And when I was uh, beginning high school, that outfit was involved with communication, teaching pe their uh, sailors, reservists, how to uh, do radio work, uh, communicate with the uh, codes. So uh, I started hanging around there. They didn't kick me out. They just let me hang around. I got to where I could work a, a key and uh, learn the code and not very familiar with them. And then they said, hey, we're, we're going on a, a cruise. Uh, Want to go along? So I said, sure. And I signed up with the Naval Reserve and went on a cruise to uh, Mazatlan, Mexico from Treasure Island. Three ships. Uh, I was on the Grady, also involved with uh, Johnson and Nicholas. And all three vessels sailed to uh, Mazatlan, Mexico. And on, on the way down, we stopped in San Diego, San Diego and armed uh, and went out by uh, St. Nicholas Island and did firing with a five inch and 40 caliber, 20 caliber, and uh, other uh, munitions on the ship. So I got to do all that too. Uh, not my fault, <laughs> they took me along. Uh, I lived on the mess deck. The mess deck is where they eat. <laughs> and the routine was, they, they get up at, the cooks get up at five o'clock, Reveille, and 5.30, everybody else gets up. Clean, sweep down four and a half. They gave me a, a mid watch, assigned me to the mid watch. So I got to uh, learn how to steer that boat and uh, be a lookout. But that was from, they woke me up at 11.30 at night, go on watch by quarter two, get off watch at four o'clock. I'd get to bed, darn it, they didn't wake me back up at five o'clock. Stay up all day, because that mess deck is there for eating, not for sleeping. So, okay, um, they assigned me to chip paint and learn how to paint that chip again. Uh, so then at noontime, at uh, 11.30 noontime, it's time to go back on watch. So that's what I did for two weeks. I had to mid-watch and uh, nighttime and daytime, learning how to, well, uh, run the ship or steal it, steer it. 300 foot destroyer. A lot how of fun. Long, how long were you? Uh, 21 years. I met a guy on there who was a Coast Guardsman, and uh, when the ship got back in, they said they didn't want me to stay in the, in the reserve because I was 15. And uh, so I waited till I was 17, and I found the Coast Guard base, and I signed up there were enlisted in uh, 53. So then 
stayed in there for, until uh, 74. 68, January of 1968, and um, uh, flew into um, Benoit Air, Benoit Air, Tonsonut Air Base, and then um, got processed into the, uh, all my, make sure all my orders came in, my health record, and updated my shots and stuff, so that process was done at the train, and about that time it was uh, China, and the Tet Offensive, the Chinese New Year, so then uh, they had, we were under rocket attacks, and, and I was kind of scared because we did, uh, we were, um, we were just being processed in, so we weren't issued any uh, ammo or rifles or anything. We were just housed in these tents, so, uh, you know, uh, luckily no rockets hit us. They were landing nearby, but then we were all, they had bunkers, so we were uh, holed up in those bunkers. And then uh, as we were running around, and then uh, uh, some of the other guys, I said, don't worry about it, don't worry, you guys are all right. But I said, yeah, I said, we ain't got, you get any weapons or anything? And he said, nah, don't worry about it. He said, right over there, he said, there's a rock. He said, there's a rock compound over there. He said, Republic of Korea, you know, White Horse, you know, division or something like that. And he said, they won't mess with those guys. So he said, you guys are all right. Okay. So then, but at that, then after the aftermath of that, we had to, we were assigned to go help out. We would go up to the, the, the field hospital and then we would help unload the, uh, the casualties that were inflicted upon the United States and then also the Vietnamese forces. So we would unload those helicopters, bring them into the, <clears throat> the emergency rooms and then they'd get serviced on. And then even uh, they bring in some of the enemy to get patched up so they can go back and get interrogated. And so I seen all of these things and then uh, got this, uh, went through that and then uh, <clears throat> was assigned to an artillery unit. You know, the, the arm, army trained me as a tank driver and a tank gunner, but I never seen a tank when I was over there. So. <laughs> Anyway, I got, I got put in artillery for about three months and started learning about uh, uh, firing a cannon, a uh, 155 millimeter cannon. Uh, we had uh, fire missions all the time of the day and night and uh, different type of uh, high explosive rounds and also some very uh, nasty stuff called white phosphorus and that would burn, you know, You'd get on here, it just burn until it burned out. It really wicked stuff. And then, uh, so I stayed with them guys for about three or four months. I went, uh, we had to travel. Sometimes we were transported by helicopter out to a, a location and then set up our, uh, our artillery guns. And then also, uh, and then we would patrol and do fire missions out closer to the Cambodian border. And, uh, so we did that for two, three months, and then they had some people that were transferred back to the United States because their tour had ended uh, down in uh, this unit called uh, 1st Battalion of the 50th Mechanized Infantry. And they were uh, armored personnel carriers. And so uh, we, I was assigned to them guys, and they were, they were, they were, they were under the 173rd Airborne Brigade. And so I stayed with them until it was time to come home. Okay, I was uh, 21 when I went into the military and I was stationed for basic training in Fort McClellan, Alabama. And it was a whole different uh, climate down there. It was warm and, and uh, kind of, the dirt was red on the ground. So it was a lot different to me. But um, I was only there for um, two months for basic training. And then uh, I came up to Washington, D.C. And I was stationed at Fort Myer, Virginia. And that's right next to the Pentagon. So then I worked at the Pentagon. But I really enjoyed my time there. And I spent my whole time there. I didn't go, I wanted to go overseas, but I never had the opportunity. Um, that was in the 50s, in the early 50s, and um, 
the Pentagon was just kind of by itself, all in the middle of in the middle of a bunch of trees, and it was kind of separate. Um, I worked in the in the low in the second basement, or in the second yeah basement, and uh, that's where all the military was. And then upstairs they had uh, like a mall. It was like a mall, and but when I would go. From Fort Myer over there, there was like um, a tunnel that went from the Pentagon over to the Fort over to Fort Myer. So we walked through there every every day when we went to work, and uh, it was it was great. It was something new that I had had never seen either then. And then um, when when that uh, plane crashed into the Pentagon, that was exactly where it crashed into. So they really knew what they were doing, you know. Well, military service is a whole different government within a, in, now it's two governments. <laughs> uh, it's a whole different way of life, in my experience anyway. And if you adopt to it, accept it, it works very well. There's a lot of things to learn that are good trades to use after you get out. And somebody, everybody's going to get out. Yeah, the, organ, the military is organized for warfare primarily. So warfare is terrible. Been there, done that. It's really a Anyway, uh, but if it survives, and many do, most people survive, then uh, you learn various trades. Uh, most of the trades that I learned, they don't even exist anymore. When I tell them about the trades of being a diesel mechanic, they, I guess that's going by the way also too, a uh, gas turbine mechanic. That's what my MOS was. Uh, well, I guess those gas turbines are still in airplanes and some trucks still use diesels, but then they now they've put all this computer stuff on them and I, I don't know how to be a mechanic for those anymore. <laughs> And one of the things that happened over there, uh, when we were with the artillery unit, we were out, no, we were, no, I was with the 100, and, we were out on patrol. Uh, when, one month we would do, we would be on the helicopters, it's called a Charlie Combat Assault, where you fly into the villages and you know, search and destroy the villages and stuff. And then one month we would be on a track, going up and down the highways, looking for bombs and checking the bridges so they didn't blow up the bridges. And then one month we would be straight on the ground, uh, legs, you know, infantry. So in this one month we were, we were out in a patrol and then uh, we found a cave and inside that cave there was a $250,000 of, uh, of uh, fifty dollar bills, and so uh, you know we took that and we turned it in to the uh, to the higher ups in our command, and then also there was some Vietnamese money there too, and uh, so but we kept that to ourselves just to buy pop and stuff like that. So we turned it in, and then uh, uh, so that's kind of one of the highlights that we discovered the cave, and then another guy was shining his light around. There was a can up there. He said, hey, what is that? Boosted a guy up there and it was, you know, five stacks of 50, $50 bills totaling $250,000. So, and then from there, you know, I just did my time, went out on patrols and I know we had to uh, see some guys get rubbed out and uh, to hold a unit and uh, we couldn't do anything about it, you know. We were trying to get there as quick as we can, but by the time we got there, they had 
it all been rubbed out, you know, so that whole, uh, and we were just over there at that, we were just on that bridge, you know. They set us up on the bridge on both sides of the bridge, and, and then, uh, so that could have been us, you know. But, uh, you know, just fortunately, we, it wasn't our turn, but we had to go over and take the bodies and take care of them and, and load them up. And then, then we were uh, stay on that bridge until, uh, you know, it was safe. We had to go out and clear the area of the enemy. <clears throat> so, and then I know that uh, I had a relative that was, uh, he was a medic and that stayed with him for a long time. And that he had to, he had to choose who got on the chopper and would be saved and who got on the chopper that didn't know they going to make it. Because, you know, it bothered him because here he was, a 20, 21 year old young man having that decision to say this is life or death. It affected him when he returned home. He had to, a lot of times he said, the only way I can go to sleep is if I pass out. He had a lot of trouble with uh, alcohol, but that was kind of his reason. Sometimes I don't, I don't think about it. And I, I told him that uh, I was in an area where he was, uh, the 173rd, where he was in his airborne unit. And uh, I met some guys that, hey, that were in his old unit. And I, he said, hey, Chief, where are you from? You know, I'm like, Nebraska. Hey, we had a medic from Nebraska. And they call him Doc over there, Doc Thomas. I said, oh, yeah, where's he from? Winnebago. I said, hey, that's where I'm from. What's his name? It's Andrew Thomas. I said, hey, that's my relative. Well, he saved my life. And a lot of them guys said that. So when I got home and I see him a couple of times, you know, he, but I read that to him. He told me, I still see them guys that I had to leave off the chopper. You know? In my dream, I still see them. But I said, at that same time, I said, you saved lives too. Because I met people that you had, you had saved. And they, they were grateful for you. you know? He said, yeah, I know, but those guys stick with me. You know? That's it. But, you know, I said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, Chinsuke. Okay, uh, when I came back from Maryland, where I was living all my life, pretty much, um, I, uh, I was looking for the veterans, and I met up with Jack, well, Jack's one, one of my relatives, Jack Lemire, and he asked me, did I want to be involved with the veterans, and I said yes, so I signed up, and um, before that, I was a member of just the Winnebago veterans, and that was headed up by um, uh, Raymond. I can't remember his name. Chuck Raymond. Chuck Raymond. He was the commander at that time, and so I signed up. And I was, even though I was in Maryland at the time, I kept every time I would come back, I would go to the meetings, and it's just a lot of uh, work. You know, we have to. Uh, go to meetings and and have meetings of our own and it was also uh, at that time they did powwow they made they did the powwows and then for a long time they uh, they just recruited people to do it now we're back to the veterans are doing it again this year how does that make so, you feel oh I'm proud I'm I'm proud of the veterans Proud to be a veteran. And people say, uh, well, Coast Guard going to war? Well, we did. Whenever uh, I was approaching a group of other military people in, when I was in country, I say, you're Coast Guard, what are you doing here? I tell them, well, there's uh, several thousand citizens here, they're entitled to Coast Guard services. And here we are. But our primary service was to uh, stop the interdiction of supplies to the country and troops. And we got engaged many times with that. Another thing we did was provide uh, gunfire support, artillery, to uh, troops around within 12 miles of the coast. Our ship would put our uh, bow on the beach in the mud to provide a, a more stable gun platform and they'd give us a, a coordinates they'd fire three rounds for effect and how that went then we maybe have to adjust the aiming a little bit then we found 
fire uh, 10 round salvos at eight seconds each between rounds and wait and see what the results was. Fire another 10 rounds. All of with my two ships that I took there for two years, we fired something like 50,000 rounds of five inch 38 ammunition into Vietnam. And it's my understanding and when we fired around this in the south part where there's rice paddies, we had we, we fired uh, rounds that would explode on uh, when they impacted. Except the rice paddies were too soggy for the first 10 feet, so they wouldn't explode. So I think they're still finding those rounds live, and they're finding them the hard way. So we didn't help them like that now. We are all raised in a warrior society and that everything is done for the protection of the, of the, the tribe. You know, the different clans had their function, but also that we were stationed strategically around the camp to protect, to protect the, the, the village. And so that, when they, when, they, when they took that away from us, and so even the hunting, where we'd go out and hunt for all of these things, and they tried to make us farmers, but they still remembered those old ways. We still have those lodges and stuff that are based upon that warrior societies and those things like that. So it, for them to gravitate toward that, you know, be a warrior, you know, you can, all of those things that they, they try to instill. And I always try to remind people that when they when they have these, the basic training that when the United States got involved in the Second World War and they, and they said, well, look at the British, look at the British, how they're training their paratroopers, look how they're doing their, their training. And then when they, the, the generals and all the military people went to visit, visit the British, they said, we based this upon the Boy Scouts, their, how they, uh, how they set up the Boy Scouts. And then the Boy Scouts was based upon how the Indian tribes prepared the things for man, you know, the Cub Scout, the Wolf Scout, the Eagle Scout, all of those things was, was that indoctrination of how the tribes prepared their young men for to be men and warriors. And so that's what I would say, that it, we go back to that. And because we were raised in a warrior society. And then be, because of the uh, the system that we have with the boarding schools and all of those things and uh, moving into towns and things like that. And a lot of that stuff was taken away for us. And then and thinking about the, the, our history with the, the warriors and all of that. So that you want to you want to do that. And then also you know, your family uh, traditions like that goes back many generations. You know, my father was a military, my grandfather and great grandfather and all of that. So. That's kind of where that comes from, that we were based upon a, we're a warrior society.